Good morning, everybody, or to all of us who are east of the Mississippi. Good afternoon. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about the month before 2020, the elect election update. Uh, joining me today is uh, Joseph McCabe uh, from Vest Point Wealth Management out of Phoenix, who will be talking in the second part of the presentation. Thank you all for attending and spending so much of your valuable time with us today. Um, the way we're, uh, what we're going to cover today will be in two sections, and I will talk a little bit about um, elections and investments, uh, the platforms and uh, the differing uh, candidates and how they may affect uh, investments going forward in summary fashion, uh, and then a, um, a summary of where kind of the polls are at and some of the complications. And Joe will talk about the income tax, estate tax, uh, consequences of the various platforms. So we think we have something uh, real special for you here today. Uh, before we get started, um, everybody's muted. If you have questions you want to ask us, please use the chat. And uh, uh, Anne uh, and Versant will collate the questions and forward them on to us. We're going to talk for 25 minutes each and then leave about 10 minutes to answer your questions. If we don't get to your questions at the end for any reason, uh, Joe or I or someone with, from uh, Versant or WealthPoint will reach out to you to make sure your uh, questions are satisfied. You get the answers you need to get. Um, if you're having connection issues watching the webinar, press the red connect button on top of your screen. That will re refresh the, the, uh, se the session and should solve any problems. Um, so let us, uh, let us begin. The election this year is is very uh, interesting. Um, there are a, there's a backdrop of pandemic, a historic recession. There's domestic strife, um, a controversial Supreme Court vacancy, and now our uh, sitting president has uh, contracted COVID-19. Um, the election could have a very significant impact on on fiscal stimulus, personal and corporate taxation regulation foreign affairs, uh, sustainability issues, climate change issues, everything across the board. There are about 35 Senate seats up, um, 222 electoral votes currently lead toward uh, candidate Biden, 125 toward President Trump, and as many as 191 are undecided, and the fate of the presidency and the Senate are in balance. So first of all, is the uh, degree to which the electorate's polarized. Uh, on the left is a Pew summary showing um, the news preferences uh, on both the right and left for the various uh, news media. Uh, Fox dominates the conservative side and CNN, NPR, New York Times, and MSNBC are dominated by the, on, on, by the left and in the middle are the traditional networks. And I think these are large, largely business decisions by the uh, cable news networks by, by and large to focus on um, these groups uh, and what they like to see, the content they like to see for business purposes. However, it does show that a lot of us are leaning toward uh, what we like to hear um, uh, very decisively in this election. Um, we're also uh, polarized with respect to how we think um, what the potential for fraud is. Uh, the, the Republican side believes there's a high percentage chance uh, for election fraud and the Democrats only a little. And the independents are kind of in the middle. So everybody has, falls on uh, extreme sides of a lot of issues. And that's um, pretty uh, constant. Um, I'm going to talk about elections and markets really quick. Uh, Anything we're going to talk about today, whether it's the future uh, elections, how the um, candidates, platforms, policies, uh, we need to be aware of that. We're probably not talking about anything here that the markets aren't aware of. Everybody else in the market's not aware of. And if that's the case, a lot of these things are at least to some extent priced into the market. In order for us to make investment decisions that are better than what the markets come out to be, the market's best guess, we have to be, be able to predict um, 
uh, or assess probabilities uh, or, or be lucky on, on a lot of different issues. It's not just who wins the election, it's their uh, the, the policy issues that they, they actually get passed to what magnitude. And then you gotta be aware, uh, right on how those policy issues affect the economy. And then you gotta be right on how those issues filter through to the investments. There's a lot of steps you have to get right for uh, your belief set uh, or our belief set uh, to generate superior investment performance. And when you tab add all those probabilities together, you get a lower probability. So it's very, very difficult uh, to come out ahead of market. So first of all, uh, looking at GDP growth rate under recent presidents, does the election uh, matter? And under recent presidents, um, there's very little difference in terms of per capita GDP growth. Um, uh, there were two good years under Reagan and Clinton, two decent years under Obama and Trump, pre-COVID for Trump. And then the two Bush presidencies um, had lots of economic dislocations. Now you can read a lot of things out in the media where uh, people make the point that most recessions fell under uh, Republican presidents, which is true. But then again, it's hard to locate the start and end of a recession and the factors that led up to it within that presidency. Um, it's not very objective game. So uh, um, this, I, I like this chart because it just says economic growth is fairly well distributed and there, it's very difficult to say that any party has a decisive um, outcome. With respect to returns uh, during election years, uh, we can pretty clearly see uh, market returns have been average, uh, uh, positive, strongly positive, uh, both in election years and the year subsequent to the election. Um, and the only exceptions here on the left are during the most extreme dislocations associated with depressionary conditions during the depression and then again in the 2008 decline. And then the annualized returns during presidential, uh, I'm sorry, annualized returns during presidential terms um, are largely positive. Again, the negative um, uh, periods uh, the who during Hoover's the depression, uh, Roosevelt in 1937, the second leg of the depression, and then the 2008 Bush, another set of the great, great financial crisis or depressionary conditions. Otherwise, uh, returns have been uniformly positive and then for the most part substantial, red, no matter red or blue, Republican or Democrat. Um, and here we see uh, that again in terms of the growth of a dollar uh, with the different presidents. We see the uh, trouble during the depressionary terms between Roosevelt and Hoover, and then, but after that, it's been a steady upward climb with a little bit of an interruption um, in the tech bubble here at the end of the Clinton years, begin, beginning of Bush, and then uh, the great financial crisis. But markets have been good pretty much for the most part, no matter who's been in, in office. There's no statistical return pattern that favors either party. And markets don't really care who we like for president. This was a, a fun little chart um, with the data from Bloomberg that shows the uh, presidential approval rating in the lower left. And you can see the best gain, uh, per annum gains um, uh, when presidents were in power were for presidents that we just kind of like. The ones that, the presidents that we really like or um, just like a little bit, uh, didn't have very good stock market gains. So you want our best odds for gains historically are for presidents that have um, not overwhelming popularity. So that, that, that's very interesting. Um, in terms of who controls Congress, again, we see a pattern of uh, steady upward growth and um, it doesn't really, uh, you have both parties in charge of periods where there have been downturns uh, with respect to control of Congress and um, the uh, great financial crisis uh, and the Democrats and then the tech bubble with the Republicans in charge. Um, there's plenty to go around for everybody. And again, there's no st st statistical return pattern uh, favoring any party that would say that, you know, if, if uh, candidate Biden's going to win or if Trump's going to retain, that, that would be better for markets. His history doesn't bear that out. In terms of election year volatility, uh, what we see is that 100 days before elections and 100 days after, um, stock market volatility is 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 pretty much the same. In fact, uh, it's it's actually a little lower 
than the volatility over the full time period uh, in question here from 64 to 19. Uh, the full time volatility is 15.7. Uh, however, um, I will say this is a peculiar year because so much um, uh, drama has been generated about whether the outcome will be accepted and there are a lot of mail in ballots and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But here's a chart um, of uh, S&P 500 implied volatility d uh, derived from the options markets that shows very clearly and this looks at volatility you can buy or sell now out into the future that right around uh, election day, November 3rd, there's a big jump in expected volatility uh, from 24.5 to 27.5 that persists out through uh, past inauguration day. So this election, before the fact, might appear a little different than, than historically. There is volatility. Markets are concerned um, about the time from election day on. Uh, in view of all that information, um, trying to game election outcomes historically has been kind of fruitless. Uh, you can see the growth of $10,000 here in a chart from the capital group of staying fully invested. Um, that would have been the best outcome out of uh, 22 cycles studied and 14 out of 22 um, and, and making consistent contributions. So if you're an investor, for example, who's in a 401k, putting money in over time, um, uh, that's also been, uh, had, a, had a great result, but sitting on the sidelines uh, uh, during elections uh, was only the best outcome in 33 of the 22 uh, election cycles and the worst outcome in 1622. So it's really never paid to try to game uh, the system. So I wanna talk a little bit about platforms uh, here and we have a fair bit of detail on the Biden platform. Um, we don't have a lot of detail on the Trump platform. They've published their um, goals, if you will, uh, uh, on their website. And I have a link for you later on in the slides, but it doesn't have a lot of specifics. So uh, with the Trump candidacy, you'll be kind of looking at, at the, where we are. Um, as a, and then the Biden will be actually looking at the results of the Biden platform. So to get a taste of what might be coming, uh, here are the stimulus plans that are being uh, argued over right now. And um, uh, the latest Democratic uh, proposal uh, Nancy Pelosi brought in was at 2.2 trillion. The Democrats first stab was 3.4 trillion, but this shows the emphasis on the different elements of the Republican plan versus the Democratic plan. And you can see the Republicans are more interested in small businesses, business tax breaks and stimulus getting money directly into the hands of people uh, with the stimulus checks and the, on, the, on the Democratic side, um, more emphasis is on state and local aid, uh, safety net measures um, and unemployment benefits, which is just a different way to get money in the hands of consumers. Uh, but it's also th more than three times as large as the Republicans. So this, this is a kind of uh, indication, A, how far people are apart and B, what the priorities are that we're likely to see extend uh, uh, post-election should uh, either side be elected. So this is a summary, if you will, of the major points uh, that we might see uh, on, on the far left side uh, with the election, Biden's election and his, uh, uh, the Democrats taking control of the Senate and on the far right, maybe uh, Trump uh, with control of the Senate, but not the House. And what are the commonalities? And so um, this is might be one of my favorite charts in the slide deck. Um, on the far left, uh, prioritize deficit spending. Uh, there'll be tax increases across the board uh, with the goal of uh, redistributing uh, income and wealth, uh, tougher regulations, uh, uh, focus on antitrust measures. Now I might move that focus on antitrust measures to the middle under commonalities because uh, there's uh, a lot of noise coming out of the right on that as well uh, with respect to the uh, large uh, technology platforms, uh, affordable health care, um, spending cuts, and so on and so forth. But the, com the commonalities um, are what might actually be, we might actually see. And so the commonalities are, you know, the, the um, deficits matter la less. Um, 
uh, there'll be increased spending. Uh, the, all kinds of all, any kind of deficit uh, discipline has gone away in Washington. Um, both sides agree on intellectual property protection. Both sides have the same attitude toward China um, uh, in terms of, of property protection and, and trade issues. Um, and uh, um, the, on, the, on the tech trade, uh, coming down on the uh, tech companies as well. <clears throat> so the poli these are some uh, one view of potential policy outcomes depending on whether, on, on where we end up. Um, uh, the, uh, the, in terms of total control of, of the presidency and Senate, we might see some limitations on stock buybacks, uh, we, uh, the exp uh, immigration reform, voting rights reform, um, but increased taxes on corporations and, and wealthy shareholders, these are all things um, that clients out there uh, should be concerned about. So I'm, I'm not really making a value judgment about the societal outcomes of, of these things or what's done with the money. I'm not saying these are good or bad. I'm focusing on investment issues and outcomes uh, for our viewers. And, and some of these will um, result in a, a de decrease in financial outcomes over time on the, on the uh, left-hand side. So here's an, uh, an estimate of the Biden spending impact of uh, his platform. Um, Increased spending in, in health, uh, health care and education, housing, uh, paid leave. Uh, the net is, uh, and on the right are, are, are in measures of income, corporate taxes, uh, uh, drugs, uh, uh, decrease in the cost of dr uh, providing prescription drugs. Now, a lot of other studies that look at this will not include that as an offset to spending. So the net spending is two, but what you'll see if you read the papers or other studies, the net spending goes from about two to 3.4. Um, so that's on top of the big deficits we already have under the Trump administration. So, and nobody is arguing for fiscal constraint. And so here's how things might look um, in, as we go forward uh, on the left, for each year are the anticipated, this is from Goldman Sachs, their, their best guess at how spending, all this platform spending and taxation may look. You can see that the income or the spending elements are kind of loaded toward the front years and the taxes start to kick in in 2022 and keep going through 2024. So spending is a little more front loaded than the taxes. Um, and on the right is what uh, the Goldman analysts think might actually happen, what might actually pass and be signed by President Biden. So we have a, a fair bit of spending on, in 2021, a lot of it uh, stimulus related. And then we have other um, more muted uh, spending and some of the other programs uh, on Biden's platform, but they're still there. Uh, that uh, Some of the spending goals do get accomplished and the tax increases aren't as large, but there's the same timing pattern, a lot of spending up front uh, taxes in the back. So this would result in fiscal stimulus um, up front and the uh, impact of the taxes would come in later. Um, so this is good for GDP growth in the front years. Um, it's also going to explode the deficits. Uh, um, so in the, in the long run, this is not good for the dollar, but it's good for the economy in the short run. And then we have contrasting policy proposals across the board. I have a list here. I, I really not going to have time to go into them all in detail. Um, but here, here they are. The ones that can be done by executive order are in, are in red there. <clears throat> and on the investment side, this is the potential impact of um, uh, tax increases on corporate earnings uh, from a baseline forecast tax increases uh, from the statutory corporate rate for 21 to 28, and then the guilty tax, which is taxing offshore generated intangible income, uh, raising that from 11 to 21. Um, so about a 10% drop in earnings, uh, $20 per share, um, as if all these changes happened at once in 2021. Now we just saw that they think they'll be phased in over time. So it may not, they may not hit right away in uh, 2021, but um, they will have an, Im an impact on earnings. And then this is uh, the impact on earnings 
uh, the schedule according to the chart before where most of the changes come in up front. Um, and, and this is the full Biden platform. And this is what Goldman expects to get actually passed, which is uh, somewhat mitigated, but still material. Um, and then by sector, uh, you might ordinarily think that the, uh, the corporate, the straight corporate in, uh, increase in the corporate tax rate would hurt um, uh, some of the old industries, which it does. This is in the dark blue, but the guilty tax that uh, taxes income from intangibles abroad takes a big chunk out of the healthcare, uh, communication services and infotech sectors uh, because they have a lot of income from these areas. So the combined corporate tax rates will be hit um, the tech sector and uh, healthcare uh, uh, adversely hard relative to some other sectors. Uh, with interest rates, um, any kind of, uh, these are projections from, again, from Goldman Sachs. These are, um, they're positing that rates might actually go down shortly after the election due to, uh, if, if there's a contested election, as people um, become worried and flee to protected uh, um, uh, safe harbors. Uh, otherwise, uh, pretty much uniformly ri uniform rise in interest rates over time, if the economy is expanding due to fiscal expansion, um, that will put upward pressure on interest rates, probably upward pressure on inflation. Um, so uh, that would not be good for uh, the fixed income markets. And it, so rising interest rates will adver adversely affect bonds. Uh, they'll affect the securities with the lowest coupons and longer maturities. Interest rate increases will also infect, uh, affect um, disproportionately stocks that we call long duration, whose earnings are way out in the future, like technology stocks versus, say, energy stocks, where earnings and dividends are being paid out substantially now. Um, rising interest rates will affect those part of this, that part of the stock market, uh, the uh, long duration part more, uh, uh, have more impact there. And then um, uh, the growth in the economy the, and the fiscal stimulus will help credit risk, at least in the short run when the uh, economy is expanding. Uh, it will pay to take credit risk in the short run. Um, on municipal debt, uh, it, if the Biden candidacy, candidacy is successful, um, in, in the instance where there are workouts between debtors and creditors, um, we saw in the uh, Chrysler and GM work, uh, workouts that other parties other than debtors and creditors were brought to the table to the detriment of the bondholders. So bondholders would want to be really careful, especially in municipal uh, debt situations where in states with big pension liabilities or just horrible fiscal uh, in horrible fiscal condition, how they might, their recovery rate might fare. It may not be as good as, as, uh, as we have seen in, uh, historically. So that would be something to keep an eye out with the quality of your uh, bond portfolio. Another thing here, the cost of uncertainty, which would favor, in my opinion, the Biden candidacy. Uh, President Trump, very unpredictable, mercurial with respect to policy announcements and tweets and um, uh, twists and turns uh, in, in, in announcements. Um, uh, candidate Biden, probably, as far as I know, would not be a tweeter. Um, and actually, J.P. Morgan has created a volatility index that, based on Trump tweets, that has been tied into interest rate volatility in the derivatives markets. So there, there's a material amount of uncertainty that the tweeting causes that affects prices in financial markets. Uh, uh, President uh, uh, candidate Biden would um, ha has signaled that he would uh, uh, try to um, bring in more parties for trade negotiations, smooth that process out, uh, to re, uh, bring our allies back together uh, with us at the table, uh, just reduce uncertainty across the board. And that would be a good thing because uh, markets price uncertainty, uh, which they equate to risk, they don't like it. In terms of personal taxes, which Joe's gonna cover real soon, um, it's important to note that most of the Biden costs don't kick in until $400,000 of income and uh, their rates are increased um, around $400,000 of income. And also at that point, uh, 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 earners would be paying social security taxes uh, on for everything in excess of $400,000. So 
for the uh, wealthy incomes beyond that, there's substantial income tax gains, but not really for the rest of, of uh, the vast majority of the population, at least with respect to marginal income tax rates. And then for investors, the one thing you want to keep an eye on is the taxation of uh, qualified dividends on stocks and capital gains. And again, uh, if your income is a million dollars or less, married filing joint, uh, it'll just be the old rates. But once you hit a million, you go from 20% to almost 40 on qualified dividend and capital gains. So if you're gonna fall into that bracket, you might wanna think about capital gain harvesting or, or um, you know, how your, your proportion of uh, dividend income in your portfolio uh, rethinking that um, if you fall into that group. So I'm going to finish up with where does the election stand today? Um, uh, I, get, I think, Joe, I get five additional minutes because I had took up that much on the intro. Right? <laughs> okay. That's okay. So if, uh, <laughs> if um, uh, this, this president has the strongest presidential election tailwinds since 1900, um, in terms of where the economy is uh, you know, uh, and uh, how, how good things look pre-COVID. Uh, if you look back in 2006, it, the, it was horrible how off uh, the various predictors and media were on the uh, election and the chances of election here. I just have some things here to remind us of how bad it was. Uh, I was certainly surprised the night of the election. And um, I think a lot of this Un, uh, uncertainty uh, people hopefully have learned from some of the mistakes and, and the projections these days will be a little bit closer. But um, here are the odds through uh, um, yesterday, basically. These are polls and betting odds in the betting markets. And we can see that in the um, betting markets, uh, which is the dark red and the dark blue here, uh, post debate, they've opened up tremendously such that President Biden is now much more widely favored than President Trump. Um, however, the polls uh, have the polls have also opened up a little bit, but the difference is not as as extreme. Um, here, here we plot the spread. And uh, so, on the previous slide, this is the difference between Trump and Biden, and you can see in the betting odds how the uh, difference for Biden has spiked up in the last few days, and the in the uh, polls, it's gone up a little bit, uh, but not the spike that we saw uh, previously. And then we're looking at registered polls that use registered voters versus polls that use likely voters. Um, we find that there's a um, uh, an increase here uh, under likely and um, a decrease in the odds, uh, the spread. Uh, this is like the opposite of what I would have expected, frankly. Um, um, for uh, registered. And so uh, the, the polls that used um, likely, I'm sorry, I said leading, I meant likely voters. The li polls that used likely voters were mo most accurate in the last election. So it'd be interesting to see how this plays out. And then this data was just from this morning, the super forecasters site, the ju good judgment site. And it's asking on, on the bottom here, what is uh, the odds on the presidential election and you can see these odds have expanded um, a little bit here post debate, not much, but a little bit. And this is the change over week is uh, plus four uh, for candidate Biden over uh, candidate Trump. Um, and then in terms of the congressional election has actually narrowed. So it could be uh, some of the voters are saying, well, if, if uh, President, if a candidate Biden's going to win, maybe I want to make sure that the uh, Senate retain remains in uh, Republican control or their, you know, but, but the, the congressional election or the Senate election is not following the presidential election at this point. And we don't, I'm just positing one reason. I, I don't really know what the answer is. Um, I think I'm going to go, the, uh, we have a slide in here for those of you want to know what the sources of those, that data was. And to finish, I just, I'm going to leave you with some contested election material. Um, the, uh, uh, number of uh, alternative voting methods. Uh, mail has risen substantially, mailed ballots over the last uh, almost 30 years. Um, and uh, the last time there was a contested election, I have a little ditty on here about how from JP Morgan, 
on how different markets behaved. They they did uh, gold went up, stocks and uh, stocks and the dollar went down, and so we're looking at a situation where there might be a contested election. Um, the main point on this slide is just that don't assume that the mail-in voters are all for the left. You have a lot of people in the service uh, who are not necessarily on the left. The, the, the um, makeup of the mail-in ballots may be a lot more diverse than we think. Um, and here is the um, Good Judgment's super forecasters uh, as of this morning saying um, there's a 9% increase of those that think that the election will be decided before the uh, 8th up to 23%, um, and and the, the percentage that believe there'll be a problem is, is, is has declined. Uh, however, there's still mo uh, the majority are still saying that the uh, election process will be extended for God you know God knows what reasons, counting ballots or disputed results or or things like that. So what we've included in here are two charts for you to go uh, go over. This is the path that would happen, what would happen in a disputed election. And um, down here is the, the, straight across is what happens in a normal election. Down to the right is kind of what happened during the Bush-Gore dispute where the Supreme Court ended up deciding. And on the top, uh, hasn't something hasn't occurred since the 1830s um, where we actually end up having the House uh, decide who, who becomes president under these conditions. And I will say something that's not very well known. If the House ends up voting under this set of circumstances, it's not the total number of House members. It is the, the, um, a vote between the states. And each state's vote would be made up according to how the House in that state is constituted, is made up. So right now, I think it's tw uh, 26 percent, 26 states are Republican and 23 states are, are Democrat. Um, and so most people are, are assume that it would be the makeup of the House. And then something we made for you this morning is um, based on uh, what happens if Trump contracts COVID, uh, the succession of power. So I'm going to stop there and uh, hand things over to Joe. And I just need to advance through some slides, I, other slides I had here in case questions came up to get to Joe's slides. And here we go. Take it, uh, Joe. Um, uh, uh, do you want me to introduce, do an introduction here or do you want to just proceed in the interest of time? I, I think in the interest of time, I'll just take over. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you about what uh, a, a Biden administration could mean for you and some year-end planning issues with respect to that. Um, 2020 has obviously been quite a year in terms of everything we've had to deal with. I mean, first it was the pandemic. Now we have fires and floods and everything going on with that. Um, and now we have the election to get through. So markets have had you know more than their share of things to deal with this year. Um, this slide down here, you know, we all know what this kind of represents. I think you know, somewhat summarizes what 2020 has been all about with the pandemic. As I was doing some research for this presentation, I came across this slide. So I thought it was kind of interesting. So we're 2020 now, if you go back 100 years into 1920, this is what it looked like in filing your taxes. Um, so I believe this is an IRS office where people are side by side, filling out their taxes. Um, not very much paperwork, it doesn't look like to me. Nothing compared to the shoe boxes that people bring in to our office to prepare. Um, and then the other thing too is that um, if, if I have my dates right and if this uh, picture is correct, um, this is only one year after the Spanish flu. So it's kind of interesting that they're all packed in here like they are. All right, so just setting a quick stage for what we're gonna do today. We're gonna cover a little bit of tax history, just give you some background, put a little context to you know, the numbers that we're gonna talk about, cover the proposals that Biden has, has put onto the table, review some planning issues and uh, ideas for a different tax regime, 
and then review some year-end planning. So here is a uh, pyramid slide of our current tax rates. So as you can see up here at the top, we have the top tax rate of 37%. Down the right side, we have the brackets for married filing joint and the left side is, is single. So you don't reach that top bracket under the current brackets right now until you get up over 622,000 for a married couple. Historically, um, tax rates, you know, in the last number of decades um, ha have been on the low side compared to historically. You can see, I'm, I'm sure it's difficult to see, but over here on the left side, we're starting out in the early 1900s, um, 1920, that picture I showed you a minute ago, is uh, somewhere in here between 60 and 80 percent. We've got some 90 percent years in here, but I'm sure in those years, um, you know, people weren't actually paying 90 percent. There was probably loopholes they could take advantage of, deductions, um, but nevertheless, that was the top marginal rate. And then uh, looking over here, you know, starting with Reagan and the different presidential administration years, you can see that the top marginal rate has been 40% um, or under uh, since Reagan. The other uh, interesting thing to um, pay attention to is that in each one of these columns where there's different administrations, um, there were changes. So every president had a tax law change. Um, so it's pretty common for that to happen. Looking at tax rates by type, uh, you can see here the purple line is income taxes. So receipts, um, what this slide represents is total federal receipts um, by the U.S. Treasury of taxes. So the purple line is um, above 40% here throughout, that's the income tax. Corporate tax is the green line, which steadily trends down over time. Uh, and this is starting in 1946. Payroll tax is the blue line, which started low and is now much higher than it was. So you could, you know, take a look at this chart and theorize that the corporate tax went down and payroll tax went up. So essentially, payroll taxes replaced corporate tax. I guess you could make that argument if you wanted to. Uh, lastly, uh, the bottom line down here in yellow is estate and gift taxes. So I kind of call estate and gift taxes the, uh, you know, stepchild of taxes or the, the political football tax because it gets kicked around a lot during debates and uh, it, you know, presidential years as to whether it's something that should or shouldn't exist. And um, the point of this is, is that the collections that the U.S. Treasury gets from estate gift taxes is very, very low, which is probably part of the reason why they've decreased their resources uh, in, in this area. Okay, so moving uh, right along to the Democratic Party tax themes, uh, we've got additional payroll taxes on high earners, increased income taxes on high income individuals, increased capital gains tax, tax wealth generally. Um, there's been proposed an annual wealth tax where you, you know, tally up your net worth every year and then a percentage of that is a tax and you have to pay that in. That was something of, of debate during the Democratic debates. Uh, and then an increase to the corporate income tax rate. So there's kind of a listing of everything that's been proposed and is on the table. We're going to kind of get into those uh, details as we go through this. So tax increases on 400000 of income. Um, if you're in this category of people that earn more than 400000 of income, then under the Biden proposals, you're, you're likely to see more higher taxes. So one idea is expanding the 12.4% Social Security tax, restoring the highest marginal rate of 396 that existed um, under the Obama administration, capping itemized deductions, and then phasing out the new qualified business income deduction, which we will get into a little bit more later. 
All right, so with respect to taxes on capital, um, one of the proposals is um, ordinary income tax rates on long-term capital gains if your income's over a million dollars. Another one is to eliminate the basis step up in death. So currently, if you own an asset that's appreciated over years and uh, when you, you pass away, that appreciation doesn't get subjected to the income tax, you get a step up and then your heirs can sell that asset later for uh, or without paying the the tax on that. So that's the step up in basis and that's been talked about eliminating that. There's a bunch of other ideas for uh, individuals, um, different credits and things that actually reduce taxes. And now to get in and talk about the increase on the social security tax that's been uh, proposed, there's, um, again, if you earn more than $400,000 a year, then there's this idea that you would um, end up paying more social security tax if you're over that $400,000 level. So currently you pay social security tax up to about $137,000 and then there's no more social security tax on your income. However, um, the proposal would be at 400,000, it kicks back in. So if you think about someone that maybe earns a million dollars and um, that's 600 over 40, 600,000 times 12%, that's another $72,000 of taxes, which can be, you know, it is significant for someone at that level. Um, It does maintain, or the proposal maintains the split of Social Security taxes between the employer and the employee. But self-employed people end up paying all of their own uh, Social Security tax. Uh, This slide I think Tom had earlier in the presentation, so I, I won't spend a lot of time on it other than to say the proposal would be the top marginal rate would would go to 39.6%. This one in the middle is is where we are today. Um, Another idea is to uh, reduce the benefit that you get for your itemized deductions. So currently, your itemized deductions reduce your taxes at whatever marginal rate you're at. for instance, if you have itemized deductions of 40000 and you're in the 35% bracket, those itemized deductions would save you about $14,000. But if they get capped at 28%, then it's only going to benefit you for about $11,000. So it's just um, there's two ways to raise taxes. One is to actually raise the rates, and then another way is to lower deductions, create phase-outs, and things like that. Um, Speaking of phase outs, this is one of the potential phase outs that the Tax Cuts and Job Act took away, but this P's limitation used to exist. So if you had itemized deductions and your income was over a certain amount, then you would lose a certain amount of your itemized deductions. So the the methodology here would be that you know, if you make a million dollars and you have, uh, you're have you over that 400000 limit, you take that number times 3%, so your itemized deductions, you'd lose 18000 of them. There's also a proposal to um, reduce the Qualified Business Income Deduction or the Section 199A. Um, that's what it's also known as. So if, if you all out there know what the qualified business income deduction is, you're probably either an accountant, an advisor, or someone that benefits from this deduction because it's complicated and most people would rather not know about it unless it benefits them. Um, But this deduction saves people with small businesses that qualify a lot of of taxes. But the theory of it is, is that if, you're over this $400,000 number, then that deduction would start to phase out and, and you would lose it, at least some of it during the phase out. Um, pointing out real quickly here, if you are an owner of an S-corp, you have S-corp income, 
the raising of these marginal rates would also affect you uh, to the point where you'd have 39.6% in this far right column uh, of taxes to pay, whereas currently in the middle column, your, your taxes are less because it flows through. Okay, on this slide, um, Tom mentioned it, but this is probably one of the biggest tax shifts that exists in the proposal. And that is, is that if you're over a million dollars of income, you're gonna pay 39.6% tax rate on your long-term capital gains and your qualified dividends. So on the next slide, we can kind of see um, how this really comes into play Right now, the top capital gain, long-term capital gains rate is 20%, and 39.6 might be the rate that you would pay in the future. So if you think about somebody who's owned their business, they built it up over many, many years, it's time for them to retire, they're selling it for millions of dollars, it just means their tax is going to be you know, potentially double what it otherwise would be. Okay, quickly on the, uh, you know, adjustment to the step up. So again, um, I talked about it earlier, the step up in basis could be eliminated and go away. And, um, you know, that would definitely be a big thing for people to think about in terms of their estate planning and their assets and, and so forth. So just something to keep in mind. The, uh, another proposal is to increase the C-Corp effective tax rate from 21% to 28%. And um, actually, Biden mentioned that in the debate the other night, raising corporate tax rates to 28%. So I, I do believe he thinks this is one that, that should happen. Um, if you think about the fact that shareholders pay taxes on the C Corp dividends, then there's a total tax that gets paid on corporate profits. So down here in the bottom right hand column, you see 59%. So if qualified dividends rate goes away and the corporate rates raised 28%, now you're talking about a 59% effective tax rate on corporate profits after they get distributed to shareholders. So ends up being pretty high. Um, so that's the end of sort of all the proposals to run through. I do have a, a number of ideas and planning issues for, thing, um, for things to think about. But keep in mind, all those proposals are just proposals. So first of all, he has to get elected. Then I, I believe, you know, the majority in the Senate has to switch to get to being democratic. Otherwise, I don't believe, you know, a Senate that has a Republican majority is going to pass any of these tax increases. So in terms of just general year end planning, you know, look at your tax brackets, look at where you are. And, you know, if you are contemplating things before the end of the year, think about what tax bracket is that going to put me in and what's going to happen. Another thing to think about is the current standard deduction now is uh, for a married couple, $24,000. So that ends up being a, a pretty high number, especially if people don't have a lot of mortgage interest, charitable, whatever. So a lot of our clients have ended up taking the standard deduction instead of, you know, the itemized deduction route. Um, and, and so, you know, one thing you can think about doing is also stacking your itemized deductions so that in one year you put as many of your deductions together as possible to get over the 24,000. And then in the following year, maybe you resort back to the standard deduction. The goal there being that you end up with higher overall itemized deductions, uh, higher overall deductions in general. Um, so the old rule, you know, was typically always accelerate your deductions, make them happen before the end of the year. But like I just said, the new rule is to really time your deductions. One quick reminder here as far as uh, charitable contributions, the CARES Act that was passed this year as, as part of the pandemic response uh, raised the limitation on adjusted gross income to 
so you can give away a lot to charity this year. Donor advised funds are also another planning strategy that um, we often recommend because you can donate the money to them, um, take the deduction this year, and then as it shows down in the bottom, you know, in your own due time, as you see fit, donate to your favorite charities, but you can kind of time those deductions a little better. Maybe you stack them up into one year to get a better benefit. Um, as it mentions here, donor advised funds aren't necessarily for the super wealthy. They can also be for people that just make, you know, regular, um, you know, amounts of, of charitable contributions. In terms of um, harvesting capital gains and losses, um, if we're looking at higher tax rates next year, then you may want to take some gains now, pay it at a lower rate and then avoid the instance of paying higher tax rates in the future. That's the idea of harvesting the capital gains now. But you have to look at the trade-off because, you know, paying the taxes now means that's money out of your pocket, and maybe you want to look at it with more of like a return on investment type of approach to, um, you know, how you recognize or realize those taxes. Harvesting capital losses, this is an idea that, you know, most advisors have employed for a long time. We talk about it. We do it. Um, so if you have a quarter or, a you know, a time period like we did at the beginning of this year where the market's down 10, 20, 30 percent, you have losses, you take them now, essentially harvest them and, and, and bank them even if you can't use them currently. Um, but harvesting losses, although it's typically a good thing, um, especially if rates are going up in the future, you need to look at how is that benefiting you? Um, and this, this chart tries to show if you've got losses, take a look at what types of income and gains you're offsetting and whether it's actually beneficial or not. So that's a good thing to work with your advisors on doing. In terms of college planning, um, if tax rates are going up next year and estate tax rates are going up, you know, definitely education planning, 529 plans and the like are, de are good to look at. Um, that's about all I want to say there, kind of in the interest of time. We're getting close to the end. Um, bracket management, look at, you know, where you are in the brackets. Um, take a look at 401k and IRAs to generate deductions and uh, decrease your taxable income. Using IRAs and Roth 401ks, you know, are good investment things to do, but they're also good tax things to do to save, um, save taxes in the long run. Here's a chart with a bunch of numbers on defined contribution limits, um, you know, pointing out the different things that you can do the big thing I like to point out, especially to people that maybe own their own business, maybe it's an S corp down here at the bottom, you can get um, deductions up to $57,000. And then if you are over 50, you get the catch up too. So you're up to 63,000 range in terms of what you can put in the plan, save for retirement, take those deductions. Another big thing to take um, a, a look at is your asset location. What do you have? What kind of income is it generating? What kind of tax rate is that happening at? Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of a complex picture, but you've got all these different kinds of accounts. You've got all these different kinds of assets that are generating different kinds of income. Take a look at where they are and whether they're in the right place or not. That'll save you taxes. Um, Roth conversions, you know, we've been dealing with these since the, uh, the dawn of the Roth IRA coming about. Doing conversions is essentially the idea of recognizing the income now with the idea that your rates might be higher in the future um, and money coming out of a Roth IRA, as long as you do it right. Um, is not subject to tax. So it's a, a great thing to do. Um, if you're looking at Roth conversions, look at your tax brackets and where they are. Um, look at whether doing a conversion like this 
this blue line here in the middle, potential optimum conversion, you know, if you're kicking yourself up to having higher net investment taxes, phasing out your qualified business income deduction, you know, you've got to look at all these things in conjunction with each other, not just is it kicking me into a higher bracket. So um, Roth conversions can be great, but you got to look at where you're going to end up with them. With respect to estate and gift taxes, probably the biggest thing in this area is that under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, the exemption basically doubled from 5.7 million. Um, now it's up to 11.5 million. And the idea is, is if the estate laws do change and that exemption were to go away, how can you take advantage of this exemption level today so if you go, um, you know, on the next slide, I've got a number of different ideas. These are ideas to talk to your estate planning attorney. So, if, you know, you're convinced estate taxes are, you know, coming back into play and um, you're going to lose that exemption. I'd talk to them sooner rather than later because they, they're already getting busy. I, I talked to an estate planning attorney yesterday that said, He's, he's already getting busy with everything that uh, is being talked about. So uh, just lastly, wanted to point out, you know, sort of a checklist of all these different items that you can do in terms of year-end planning. So we talked about bracket management, itemized deductions, take a look at what you have going on in your life and, and your picture, you know, retirement planning, funding IRAs, 401ks, if you have stock options, you got to look at the timing and the tax that you're going to pay on those. Estate planning and, and uh, you know, annual gifting and things that, uh, you know, you could be looking at there. In terms of a checklist for a Biden administration, there's uh, bracket management, you know, is a, a big thing like we talked about, itemized deductions. Um, one quick thing to focus on is if you think you know, or if we get into November, December, and we know Biden's going to be president, we know the, the Senate's flipped, and we're going to be dealing with new tax laws, this state and local tax limitation of $10,000 could go away. So you might want to postpone taking your state tax deductions like property taxes, state tax payments, defer those into next year. And, you know, who knows, maybe you get a benefit for that. Um, and then lastly, charitable contribution timing on that page. We talked about gain and loss harvesting, retirement planning, executive planning with your options. Um, and then lastly, uh, estate planning, you know, take a look at those exemptions. If you're in that category with your estate, look at all those issues and, and what you should be doing. So with that, um, I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, Sorry, we kind of ran over, but I'll turn it back over to Tom and uh, take any questions that we have time for. Joe, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful analysis. Uh, Joe's a certified public accountant and a CFP with Vest Point Wealth Management uh, and has more than 20 years experience uh, with tax and wealth management planning. Um, and uh, I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we're, we're out of time, the allotted time here. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll, we have your questions and uh, either Joe or I uh, will touch base with you to follow up on them. Uh, I wanna thank you very much for spending the time with us today. It was a lot of fun for us to do this, uh, put it together. It helps us uh, get our thoughts clear and, and concise and consistent as well. I just wanted to mention that on um, we have another webinar on October 15th, Guiding Goals, uh, the story of Carolyn Gaynor, an advisor who's a triathlete who serves as a guide to visually impaired and blind endurance athletes. And our uh, own Elizabeth Shaybaker will be uh, uh, moderating that uh, webinar and you're all welcome uh, to attend that. So thank you, Joe, and thank you all who've attended. Uh, and we uh, very much value the time you spend with us. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you.